My name is Kevin Leininger. I'm the CEO of IntegraChain, headquartered in Princeton, New Jersey. We have a product called DNA, which is a subscription-based product we sell to U.S. life sciences companies. They use this technology to do a variety of things, from order monitoring, order forecasting, better managing their sales and marketing activities, and their production planning. For example, they could see a transaction of a particular size. They'd like to be notified immediately. We can do that, whether it be by BlackBerry, iPhone, or any other mobile device right from the cloud. Our customers buy three to five year subscriptions, pay us on an annual basis for those long term subscriptions. Our growth rate has been north of 60 percent over the last three years. Our goal is to continue that for the next three to five years, achieving about 70 to 75 percent market share on data coverage across all of U.S. life sciences. Thanks for having us here and uh, we're very you. excited to, to be here. It's a great opportunity for entrepreneurs to come to a place and Talk to other entrepreneurs, because as you well know, there are a lot less entrepreneurs than there are non-entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very interesting to be here. Most entrepreneurs are relatively unstructured. We are all that way by nature. Um, and, and one of the things I'm going to take away is our ability to apply a little more scientific method, if you will, to management, mm -hmm. which I've always done more intuitively, I think probably like most entrepreneurs do. I'd be interested in your thoughts of, of how CEOs and, and entrepreneurs can do a better job in working with our boards. Right, because boards are very results driven mm -hmm. in my experience. You know, they, they don't really want to hear so much about the process, frankly, most of them. Uh, they want to hear about the result. And so do you have any thoughts on how, you know, CEOs might do a better job of, you know, maybe it's picking the right board members, mm -hmm. but also what we can do to do a better job of helping the board to understand mm -hmm. the importance of that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, what I found, because I did it wrong the first time, is the board was more about uh, the name recognition of our board members to give us credibility for our customers was that they had capital behind them. And, um, and there's certainly a need for some of that. But the, the board I've switched to now is much more augments our strengths or, or our weaknesses, I guess. But there are also people who are in places where we want to go. And so if you're going to select board members, I think it's uh, you know, trying to anticipate people that could... Uh, we've never done research. None of us. We come out of for-profit backgrounds. None of us are big research-oriented uh, backgrounds, but that's something in the future that we may need to be able to show is how are all these uh, small businesses really making progress and impacting the economy at the jobs, and how would we show that? So putting someone with research on there really gives you that. And then they come at it from such a different perspective, mm -hmm. so I guess it's listening to those questions, and after they've asked it the third time, really saying, is there something there? That, that I need to go back and really look at because you do you know, become so uh, single-minded as mm -hmm. your whole organization become of the same thought. And so you're right, using that external perspective and really getting a relationship and the right people that aren't there just to check a box or make money or uh, you know, sit around and watch a, a dog and pony show but are really there to say, why would you do that? Or have you thought about over here? and ask the good questions I think makes a huge difference. Yeah. So. Well, a couple of rules on the board for what it's worth and some of the things that I, I learned over the years is number one, you want risk-taking peers. You don't want a lot of people on your board that are retired. Uh, you don't want people that are less developed in terms of their skills or their organization. You want people that when you look around the table you see people that you have tremendous respect for, and they have tremendous respect for you. And you, because you'll listen to them. If they're, if they're risk taking and they're peers, you listen to them. If they're just talking theory, okay, fine, I can read that in a book. I can get that on, you know, I can get that on somebody's, somebody's web page. And the other thing, where as much as possible, you want independent board members. Now, you got a venture capital funder, you're going to have a venture capitalist on your board. That's the way it is. But if you can hopefully get some independent folks as well, that's tremendously valuable. What's the thought process, Clay, on having, uh, so if you have venture capital and you've got a board that's required in a certain space, of also putting an advisory board for, the, for, for like Kevin himself that's more just around conversation than it is about you know yeah. the performance of the company and stuff yeah, like it that. Could be perhaps a little less focused on the results and maybe more on the process. Yeah, and more so on the actual business and strategy. That's a good idea. Well, if your investors would, you know, you, again, investors are going to have to, you know, they're going to have to weigh in on that. Mm -hmm. 
because I'm sure they're going to want to know who's going to be giving you advice and what kind of advice they're going to be giving you and, and all of that. What, what was your thinking and kind of how did you, you know, think about how to evaluate opportunities, you know, and sort of you know, were, were you pretty rigorous financially? Did you use more of your, kind of your gut feel, which is, you know, my history, right, mm -hmm. frankly, and probably most entrepreneurs, uh, and just say, now, nah, but I just know that this is the right way to take the business, right? Do you have any thoughts on maybe when it's, when we can't do that anymore, you know, uh, and what we should be doing to maybe be a little more rigorous about that, that analysis? Yeah. Well, and the first, the first thing we, we needed to do is we were already not focused enough. Just by the nature of I was running the business and I had a little, I had a little project going on in horse feed. I had a little <laughs> bit of this and I had a little bit of that going on. So the, the first thing we needed to do is we really needed to focus on what is the core business and what are we going to do with that. Then we had a basis of interest process. So whenever an opportunity came along, we would absolutely look at it like a, just like you'd look at a business plan. And then we would decide, based on that information and what we had on our plate, how much of that, how many of those opportunities were we going to take on. So it was, it became from, well, shoot from the hip in the early days to a very rigorous mm -hmm. basis of interest analysis kind of thing. Now there's always going to be those swags, there's going to be those times when somebody says, well, based on all the data, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, I want to do it anyway. <laughs> I mean, how many times do you think Stephen Jobs had somebody at the board level or somewhere in, within his organization saying, no, we don't want to go that next step. You know, we don't want to, who's going to want to have a, you know, listen to music all the time on those little, little boxes, <laughs> yeah, that's you know? True. So you, because and you have to have somebody with that vision, but I think in in our case that discipline was I certainly had to conform to the process, and I had to sell it to the board. My, Leon Danko, one of my mentors, said one time, "Never, never buy what you can't sell." So you shouldn't be buying something if you respect your peers, your board members. You can't sell them, you shouldn't buy it. And it was a good, that was good advice. On the other hand, we had some opportunities that I didn't think we needed to take advantage of that we ended up taking advantage of because of the analysis. Canned pet food. I was against canned pet food. Inefficient. You know, shipping, you know, the container is worth more than the, the value of the ingredient. And it's 72% water. When we were delivering excellent nutrition at a relatively low right. per day usage cost. And for us to get into the canned cat food and, and dog business just didn't make any sense. The only thing is, it was 20% of the entire industry. So when we looked at it and the board looked at it and our senior management looked at it, they convinced me with some criteria, right. okay, that we ought to get into the can business, and it became a hundred million dollar company and made about ten million, you know, before tax, which was not a bad was not a bad business, for sure. You know. Yeah.